Thank you for coming. It's nice to see you all. Uh, we're very interested to hear what uh, the experience of this lady here, so we trust that we'll all be benefited by it. Now I'll hand you over to Douglas. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, anyway, thank you very much for coming. Nice to see everyone here. We're going to talk today about this lady, Johanna Ruth Dobschuner. Now, I'm quite pleased that everyone called her Hansi because that's a lot easier to say. So we're going to refer to her as Hansi. Uh, I know that there are some people in this room who've met this lady. She was known to her friends and family as Hansi, so that's how we'll refer to her today, because it's quite a mouthful. Um, there are folks in the room who knew this lady, uh, because she ended up uh, living in Glasgow. Um, but uh, she was born in Berlin, and she has quite a story to tell. She actually wrote a book, um, which is entitled Selected to Live. And I think one of the reasons why that title is given is that out of all her family, she was the only one who survived. Um, and she was just a young teenager at the time. And she felt, uh, you know, the dreadful um, concentration camps and so on, what they had was selection. They selected those who were going to live and those who were going to die. And one went one way, one went the other, some to the gas chamber, some to the work. And uh, I think maybe this title reflects that, selected to live. She felt not selected by the, the Nazis or the Gestapo, but selected by God. And she traced God's hand in her life. And that's what we're going to think about uh, this afternoon. Uh, she was born in Berlin um, in 1926. Um, and her earliest memories really are in the 1930s, 1933. Quite unusual. Uh, it was Hitler's birthday. And the massive parades and flags and so on. And she was a six-year-old girl and she was selected to bear the flag for her class. And they were in Berlin and they were marching past Hitler standing there with his salute and they're presenting him with gifts and so on. And the classes are all marching past with the flags. And here's this wee Jewish girl and she's, uh, she's been selected. When she got home at night, her parents were absolutely terrified because they knew what was coming or they suspected what was coming. They'd heard Hitler talk uh, enough. Uh, and they thought there's some plot here that the, our child has been selected. However, nothing adverse came of that. But that's one of our first memories in one of these massive rallies uh, to celebrate the birthday of Adolf Hitler. And in the early 1930s, of course, before the war began, but Nazism was, was on the increase. Um, and you can see at the bottom here in Berlin, it was quite common to have... Uh, sort of pickets outside Jewish businesses saying don't go in here. This was how it began. Of course it then began to closing down the businesses, the ransacking the businesses and you know where it all led. But it started like this and um, Hansi's uh, father had a department store in Berlin. They were Dutch Jews but they moved to, uh, to Berlin uh, many years ago and uh, Hansi was born in Berlin and they had this store in Berlin. However, with the rising tide of anti-Semitism, uh, they were feeling increasingly uncomfortable, as you can imagine. And the Dutch uh, council advised them that they should leave for Amsterdam as soon as they could. So in 1935, in April 1935, they moved to Amsterdam and um, they had to leave everything behind. Uh, they more or less um, had to just uh, force sale all the goods that they had in the department store and they arrived almost like refugees in Amsterdam. She didn't know a word of Dutch. She'd been born in German. German was a, lang Germany. German was a language, uh, but they arrived there in 1935. And they felt, although they had to start more or less from the start, from the beginning, they felt at least there was a period of relative safety. Well, that didn't last too long because five years later, uh, Germany invaded Holland. Uh, on the 10th of May, 1940, the Nazis invaded Holland and it led to, uh, well, the, 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 the country collapsed very quickly because Holland, the Netherlands, was uh, a neutral country. Uh, they didn't expect to be invaded. They didn't have much of a defence force. I think it was a matter of days. Queen Wilhelmina fled to London uh, and the country was very quickly uh, occupied by the Germans. So the nightmare had come true. The, the danger that they'd fled had followed them to Holland. Well, it began, of course, with new laws being imposed 
uh, on the Jews. Uh, first of all, they couldn't own a business. Uh, then they couldn't own a, a motor car. Then they couldn't own a bicycle. Then they couldn't use public transport. And then, in uh, 1941, they introduced the Yellow Star, which became uh, so well known, sadly. Infamous Yellow Star, so you could highlight, you could spot a Jew in the street. They had to wear it in a conspicuous part of the clothing, and uh, they were just fair game. And there was so much anti-Semitism, and uh, it was becoming harsher and harsher under the uh, Nazi occupation. There's a reason for that. Um, there's a reason why the Jews have been picked on throughout the centuries, and they're still being picked on today. And that is, if you go right back to Bible history, you'll find that there have been repeated attempts to destroy the Jewish nation. And that is because God had promised that the Messiah would come from the Jewish nation. And uh, the Jewish nation still have a purpose in God's plan, and that's why they're under such attack and will be right to the end. However, the raids on Jewish homes began, deportations, uh, typically in the night, uh, they, would, they would move into a neighborhood with these big wagons and uh, it would be uh, shouting and banging on doors and getting people out and they would round up and in the morning you never knew if your neighbor was still there or not. It was like that. And one uh, afternoon, um, Hansi's two brothers, uh, there were three in the family, they were out walking. Um, it was still safe enough to go out. Uh, during the day at least, but they were walking in the park and a van stopped and bundled them into the back. They were never seen again. A few months later, uh, the family received a box of ashes and this was Werner uh, who had been killed and Manfred died a few months later in some concentration camp. Never saw him again. And so it was this feeling of, she was just a young girl at the time, it was a feeling of terror that what was going to happen next, the feeling that they were completely helpless um, and of course, uh, we should pay tribute to many Dutch Christians who people like Corrie ten Boom, uh, and, and we're going to hear about others uh, in this presentation, who risked their lives and sometimes gave their lives to shield and uh, protect the Jews. Um, Hansi, here she is as a young girl, was always interested in becoming a nurse. She wanted to be a nurse. Um, and she would go along to the, there was a Jewish hospital in Amsterdam, which is shown here, and she would go along there just to be with medical people and to help as she could. And she got to know the staff there. And uh, she, uh, as a young girl, under incredible strain, waiting every night for this banging on the door, decided that she would have a plan. And her plan was an appendix for two weeks' safety. And so she arranged with a sister in the hospital. She was perfectly healthy. She didn't need her appendix out. But such was her terror of this in the night that at least for two weeks she thought she'd be safe in the hospital. And she went there one night and they arranged to do this operation. They took her appendix out and didn't need to do it at all. But she wanted it simply to feel safe for at least two weeks she could sleep at night, feeling a relatively safe in the Jewish hospital. Well, later on that year, uh, Hanukkah. Does anyone know about Hanukkah? Hanukkah is the festival that's celebrated by the Jews uh, early in December. And they give gifts a wee bit like we would do at Christmas time. Uh, they give gifts and so on. And, and the approach to Hanukkah, um, uh, this girl Hansi was thinking about um, the history of the Jewish people and she was reading her Old Testament scriptures, the Jewish scriptures, and she was thinking, where is God today? Where, you know, this history that we have, God doing this for us, God doing that, where is God today? And she said that almost out of the blue, these three words came into her mind, God with us. And she said she didn't know where they came from. Well, we know where they came from, of course. They came from the Bible. Uh, Emmanuel means God with us. But she, uh, these words just came to her and she said, uh, writing about it later, she said that at this time she, become, she became for the first time God conscious. She realized that God was there and that God was with us. And for the Hanukkah uh, celebrations, she made uh, little uh, handkerchiefs and so on for her family as gifts. And she embroidered onto each one, God with us, God with us. 
And uh, her parents were quite startled to get this because although they were traditional Jews, they weren't really that religious. Uh, and uh, they were quite surprised. And where did you get this from? And who told you this? And she said, for the next few years, the experiences she went through, these three words were what kept her. The, the fact that she didn't know much about it, but she just had this word in her mind that God was with us, despite all this that's happening, despite the, the horrors of uh, Nazi occupation and the Holocaust that was unfolding uh, at the time. Well, the, uh, the, eventual, the, the inevitable happened on the 9th of April, 1943, uh, there was a banging at the door at the in the middle of the night, and uh, this was a hurry up, hurry up, out, out, everybody out. She was lying in bed, Hansi was lying in bed, and she, her room, there was a partition, the, the, the main bedroom had been divided into two, there was a partition, and she was behind the partition. And she just cowered in her bed, and she heard them pulling everyone else out, the cries, the screams, everything, and she just lay quiet, and eventually she heard the footsteps going away and she had been missed. She had been left behind. Well, she got up, it was the middle of the night, and after a period of just complete grief and being overwhelmed, she thought, right, what am I going to do? So she put on as many clothes as she could. She packed her bag with what she could, uh, anything she thought might be of any help, and she sat in a chair in the darkness, afraid to put on a light, and she sat and waited until six o'clock in the morning. Six o'clock in the morning, she stole out of her apartment and she went along to a nursery, this child's nursery, where she helped from time to time. She was in a complete daze, as you can imagine. I think she was 15, 16 at the time. Complete daze. And uh, uh, they said, what's happened? And she just said, they've gone. And everyone knew what had happened because it was happening all over the place. You come in and you'll be okay here. And she stood at the window, and opposite the window was this building, which was the theater where all the Jews were taken. And she stood at the window and watched, and she saw her parents being loaded onto a truck and being driven away to the station, and she never saw them again. That was the last time. Just a young girl, and her family were taken, and uh, she was left behind. <coughs> well... <clears throat> Uh, eventually, she was the, the, the Jewish Board of Guardians, a kind of organization that looked after the Jews at that time. They placed her with a family in the town, and she went to the nursery and helped there, but she was staying with this family in the town. But eventually, uh, they caught up with her, and she was arrested on the 20th of June, 1943. They came and said, who's this girl staying with you? Realized immediately she was Jewish. That was it, straight into the theater and on the way now to the railway station. Well, when Hansi got to the railway station, Central Railway Station, Amsterdam, she'd never seen such a mass of humanity before. All kinds, all ages, young, all crowding together up the main steps into the, into the, um, the railway station and then crowding along the railway platform and then these cattle trucks coming in, as you can see, maybe not so well there and then being forced into the cattle trucks and then one left and then another one come and another one would go in and eventually she was being pushed she couldn't resist she was being pushed and as she was being pushed along <clears throat> as she was being pushed along she got in touch with us there was a family next to her they had a wee baby in a pram and and there's a mother and father and one or two other children so she loved children so she sort of attached herself to this pram to look after this child and, and felt, well, I can, I'll be with them. And eventually their turn came and they were lifted up, pram and all, everything, into the cattle truck. And the doors were closed. And then uh, she looked down at this baby and the baby was overheated. <laughs> the child was face bright red, you know, bawling its head off. The woolen cap on its head. So she took the woolen cap off, and here there were red spots, heat spots. But she thought immediately, scarlet fever. So she went to the grill and she shouted, scarlet fever, scarlet fever, a case of scarlet fever in this carriage. Well, immediately they opened the carriage door. I'm a nurse, she said. She wasn't really a nurse. I'm a nurse. This child's got scarlet fever. We've got to get them out. This family's all infected with scarlet fever. And before you know what had happened, the, the guards were helping them down and taking them out. Go over to that post. There's a doctor over there. I think he was a Jewish doctor or a very sympathetic Dutch doctor. Over in the corner, you go and see him. So she went and 
could hardly believe it. There they were, and she's carrying along this case of scarlet fever, <laughs> and uh, it was no scarlet fever at all. But uh, she was taken, and then when she got to the doctor, of course, and got the family, they were all delighted to get out of that carriage, and she got to the uh, doctor. The doctor realised, of course, immediately what, had, what was happening. He said, no, you're my nurse. He said, you go around the station and pick up as many ill people, ill people as you can. And she couldn't do too much because uh, it would look suspicious. But she went here and there. And here's a lady obviously expecting a child. She'll, she's all right. You're, you're a, a candidate. And so they soon gathered together. So she was quite a bold girl. And she went to the guards and said, we need transportation back to the hospital. We need to get these people back to the hospital. They've got, some of them got scarlet fever, some of them seriously ill. Well, lo and behold, ambulances arrive and they're loading people into them. I've got a few loads of ambulances and the doctor says, no, you go in the next one, don't come back. So she, in she went into the ambulance and uh, she arrived back at the hospital, the Jewish hospital. Of course, they knew what had happened. Right, you stay here. You're here with us now. You're staying here. So... That was a miraculous escape, and uh, she was absolutely amazed at what had happened. Well, um, that was okay for a few weeks, and then there came an announcement over the loudspeakers in the Jewish hospital. The guards had arrived, and all those who joined within the last six months to assemble in the courtyard, this was it. It was, it was another uh, purge, another um, collection, and so... Here she is back again uh, at the railway station and uh, she is being herded into these uh, trucks. And uh, she got inside this time and she'd kind of resigned herself, I think, to a fate. And the doors were closed and the, the, the bar had come down and she'd on a kind of nurse's uniform. And some of the people with her said, you're a nurse, what department were you in? She said, infectious diseases. They started banging on the door. <laughs> they said, guards, take this woman out. She's, she's, uh, she's been working with infectious diseases. Isn't it sad? These folks were going to their death. They didn't know it. But they were going to their death. They were, they were afraid they might get an infectious disease. And they pleaded. Eventually, the guards opened the door, pulled her out, told her to go back to the hospital. So here she is, twice almost from the jaws of death, she's been uh, delivered. And uh, she managed, through this infectious diseases, uh, she managed to get back uh, to the hospital. So... Um, eventually, she was able to live here for a while until even that became quite uh, dangerous. And so the director of the hospital said, what we're going to do, we'll put you on district nurse work and you will stay with a couple in the city, a Mr. and Mrs. Sim. And uh, her, Mrs. Sim's not well. You'll be her carer, basically, and you'll be linked to the hospital, but you'll stay there. It's probably safer for you there. So that's what she did. And uh, she was then... Uh, staying with this couple and looking after this lady and seemingly everything was fine. She had to go back to the hospital occasionally. Well, one day, uh, Mr. Sim came back and said they're emptying the hospital. And uh, here they were uh, pulling um, uh, people out of beds, uh, just clearing the entire hospital, whole wards, everyone out, straight to the concentration camps, straight to the, the railway station. And he said, don't, whatever you do, go to the hospital they're clearing out there. And she thought, I've got to get out of here. I'm bringing these people into danger. And eventually she contacted somebody. Uh, there was a home for the aged. Again, it was a kind of Jewish institution. And she managed to get um, work there and be able to live there. So this is just cat and mouse all the time. She's trying to keep one step ahead of uh, the, the Nazi authorities. And... Uh, the strain of this, as you can imagine, I mean, you can hardly imagine that. The strain of it, just trying continually thinking today, maybe they'll catch me today, eventually took its toll, and she decided that she was going to give up. And she decided in her mind that on the 6th of September, she was going to walk along to the theatre where all the Jews were kept, and she was going to just hand herself in. She couldn't take it any longer. It would be better knowing, well, that's what's in, ahead of her. And she actually left um, the old people's home, uh, in the evening and started to walk towards the theatre and she had someone running behind her and here it was her fellow nurse who grabbed her by the hand and physically pulled her back and, told, and managed to convince her not to go. Well, it's quite, a, quite remarkable really. Two days later, there was a porter in this home for the aged by the name of Jan and he worked for the Dutch underground 
and he tried to get suitable candidates to go underground. So basically they would take these uh, Jews, they would hide them, they would move them around the country and so on. And uh, he'd suggested it to her before, but she didn't think that was really, um, it was quite a risky thing to do. But <clears throat> um, he said to her, now there's, there, there's a problem here. The girl that was going to go has got the flu. She's in bed. She's not going to be able to go. There's one place you can go. This is two days after she tried to give herself up. And she said, you can go, you can go tonight, but you've got to make up your mind now. And she just felt, right, I've got nothing left, I'll go. And she went underground. So that night, uh, as she was leaving, um, he told her an address. She had to go to an address, she had to act in a certain way, she had to take out a handkerchief and so on. And then the door would open, they would let her in. And so she did. And that night she went and she met this man, uh, a young, tall, uh, slim, a Dutch man, and he said, just call me Domi. Well, his name actually was Bastian Johan Eder. Um, and uh, he should be a lot more famous than he is. Uh, because what he did, uh, he and his wife lived in the countryside in this house. A book's been written called The House of Defiance. And he was uh, a minister in the Dutch Reformed Church. And he had made it his mission that he would help the, Jew, the Jews who were going underground, who were trying to escape the Nazis. And so he took uh, Hansi out to this house. Um, his wife ha had a child and was expecting another child, so she was basically coming to help her, and she was more or less hiding in the house. So never allowed to go out, never allowed to go near the windows, had to keep, anyone came to the door, there was hiding, hiding places in the house and so on. But she was there, under the protection of this man uh, that she knew as Domi, who was actually Bastian Johann Eder and his wife and family. So there became a period of relative security, relative peace. They were quite removed from the city. They didn't see much of the soldiers. And uh, they had a system in place that if someone was coming, there was a lot of alarms and, and uh, people were passing messages on and so that the Jews that were with them could be hidden. And that's where she was for a few months. Well, while she was in the home of Domi, <clears throat> uh, he had a massive library and she picked up this book, which was a Dutch children's Bible storybook. So she picked up this uh, storybook, this uh, children's Bible storybook, and she started to read it. And she was soon very uh, interested and fascinated by this prophet that she'd never heard of before, this prophet called Jesus. And uh, she, of course, it was just a child's book and it had illustrations and so on, but she was fascinated with this. Why, shouldn't, why hadn't she heard about this before? And then she noticed on the shelf that there was a Dutch Bible. And so she took up this Dutch Bible and began to leaf through it. And she quickly understood that here, this is our scriptures, the Old Testament, this is our scriptures. And then she came, there was a blank page, and she thought, what's happening next? And she turned the page, it's a New Testament. And she'd never come across this in her life before. And she started to read and she'd never heard of Jesus before. She'd never heard, she'd never thought about Jesus before. She'd only heard about the Jewish religion, the Old Testament scriptures and so on. And she started to read this. And uh, this is what she said. God was explained and portrayed so clearly by this prophet Jesus that I almost felt that I knew him. She had been concerned about this, that there was a God, a God that's with us, but a God that's so remote and so unknowable. And she says, I could depend upon him. It only worried me when he made definite claims regarding his purpose on earth or his authority or proclaimed his apparent divinity. So she was, she was reading. She was reading about the Lord and she was really impressed by him. And uh, she went on to say that some of his own words would come to me. No man comes to the Father but by me. Come to me and I'll give you rest. Unconsciously, he had stolen his way into my life and I could no more think of God without visualizing Jesus. So it's quite amazing really because that's what the Bible's all about. The Bible says that God is manifest in flesh, that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And what she was dis discovering was that uh, this invisible God that she wanted to get to know. When she read about Jesus, and then she thought about God, all she could think about was Jesus. And so she was learning about this, and she was reading. And for the first time, she started reading the Gospels. And uh, 
In February 1944, she heard her first Christian sermon. She was hiding in a connecting passageway at the rear of the church. This is where all the Jews went because no, the congregation didn't know they were there. They didn't know they were hiding in the manse. Or in the, in the, but, but there was a kind of connecting passageway. And if they wanted to hear the sermon, they said, bring a hot water bottle because <laughs> uh, it's cold. And just sit outside here and you'll hear. And she heard for the first time somebody opening the Bible, teaching about the Lord Jesus, preaching about him. Absolutely amazing. She'd never heard anything like it before. She was reading through the Gospels. And she got to the story of the crucifixion. She was absolutely horrified. You know, this is amazing. We're all so used to this. But here is somebody reading the New Testament for the first time. They read about this man, wonderful prophet, wonderful teacher, miracle worker. He's so kind, he's so good, he's so wonderful. And she thought, he is a wonderful person. And then she came to this horrific death. And she read the details. And she said... According to the custom of my people, I mourn for him seven days. It was so vivid and real. And she couldn't, when she got to the cross, she didn't eat food. She just had water and bread for the next seven days. According to the custom of her people. She was so moved by this story of the death of this prophet Jesus on the cross. And after that, she kept this period of mourning. Quite incredible. And after that, she read John chapter 20, and she read about the resurrection. And she writes, joy, I could have jumped with the thrill I experienced. I read on, delighted with the miraculous change in events. Can you imagine somebody reading it for the first time? All their hopes are dashed. And then she read about it, it was John chapter 20, Mary standing at the tomb weeping, and she thought, that's just where I am. And then she hears a voice behind her saying, Mary. And she turns, it's the Lord Jesus. He's risen from the dead. She could have leapt with joy. And the more she read on, the more she discovered that this wasn't just some random act of cruelty. This was God's plan. The cross was God's plan. The resurrection, it was Jesus paying the price for our sins. And uh, this was all just flooding into her, flooding into her. She'd never heard anything like it before. And she kept thinking to herself, why don't our own people accept him? She couldn't believe it. Why was it? Um, and then things came to a head on Easter Monday, 1944. She was working downstairs in the kitchen. She said, I left my potatoes half peeled, laid down my knife, rose from my stool, and without explanation left the little room. Among the attic beams and a little corner of the roof, I slowly knelt down, clasped my hands in absolute surrender, and closed my eyes. Rabboni Yoshua Hamoshiach, Master Jesus Christ, was all I could whisper. And she, at that moment acknowledged that this prophet Jesus was more than a prophet, that he was God and that he was her saviour and her master. And at that moment, she trusted Christ and she was saved. Her sins were forgiven. Well, what a tremendous change in her. And the people who were working with her, who'd noticed for the past few weeks that she'd been in a kind of depression, they just thought it's because she's obviously lost all her family and she's a, a fugitive and she's hiding. They realised... There's a big change in her now. She's suddenly happy. What is it? And she told them what had happened, that she'd come to know this Rabboni, Yoshua, Hamushiach, that Master Jesus Christ was her Savior and the Lord, and her life was completely changed. Well, after that, 1944, it was then a case of being moved between safe houses because it was no longer safe for them all to be in this house. They felt they were being watched. The area was being watched. And so she was moved from one safe house to the next, one safe house to the next, always trying to keep one step ahead. And with others, there's quite a story. You should read the book yourselves. I'm sure you have. But uh, many times, very close to arrest, miraculously managed to escape until eventually the liberation of the Netherlands took place at the end of 1944 into 1945. And she was on the street, I don't think she was in this picture, but she was on the streets waving and shouting and crying with joy, as were some of the other residents when the Allied uh, forces moved into the town and liberation had come. Well, she soon discovered the bitter sweetness of liberation without your family. She had lost them all. Her, 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 her brothers, her mother, her father, close relatives had all gone. And she made her way back to Amsterdam. 
and she linked up with the Jewish community back in Amsterdam. And she tried to explain to them what had happened. And she thought they would just immediately say, isn't that wonderful? We'll accept him as well. But they didn't. And uh, they said, you've become an apostate. That's what you've done. She'd never, she didn't think of it like that. She thought she'd just taken the natural step, and so she had. She'd just taken the natural step from Judaism to Christianity. She'd just taken the natural step from believing in the God of the Old Testament to believing in the God of the New Testament. And she had taken that step. Anyway, while she's in Amsterdam, she wants to go to a church. So which church does she pick? The Church of Scotland. <laughs> As you would. Uh, well, I'm not sure if you would, but <laughs> I'll leave that just now. <laughs> leave that. Um, so eventually she is in Amsterdam. She's going along to the Church of Scotland. And uh, she gets this in her mind that she wants to go to this mystical place <laughs> called Scotland. She wants to go to Britain. And in 1947, she in fact moved to Glasgow. And she moved to Glasgow. Um, sorry, let me just tell you this before we get into the Glasgow story. Um, just after liberation, she got word that Domi had been arrested. Uh, he had been tortured by the Gestapo. He had refused to reveal one name of all the people he'd hidden. And he was uh, 35 years old, as you can see. He was tortured and executed by the Gestapo just right at the end of the war. The Netherlands have issued stamps in his honour. He's quite well known in the Netherlands. He's not very well known here. He ought to be. Um, and I think they reckon over 200 Jews personally he sheltered during the Nazi occupation and paid for it with his life. Anyway, um, Hansi moved to Glasgow. She was going to train as a nurse. Uh, she was intending maybe to go to Israel and to help in a hospital there. But plans changed. She met a Scotsman. Uh, well, what better man could you meet? Uh, a man called Donnie Douglas and they were married and Hansi became Hansi Douglas and she lived um, I think the rest of her life in Glasgow. Um, she was involved in bringing the gospel to the Jews. She was involved in charitable work uh, for uh, the Jews. Uh, she was a public speaker. Uh, she shared her experiences of what she had been through and I think uh, uh, Jeanette can remember her, Jeanette lived just round the corner from her, I believe, went to Bible studies with Hansi Douglas. So she's within living memory of people in this room. And uh, she was quite a remarkable lady. Her, her husband, I believe, uh, contracted polio later on, I believe, and was quite an invalid. And she nursed her husband. She had two uh, daughters, I think. So uh, eventually, 13th August 2002, uh, Hansi passed away. One of the things she said was, can a saved soul cease to long after for another's salvation? In other words, she was saying, how can I, as someone who's been saved, someone who's been forgiven, how can I not long that others will be saved as well? Isn't that wonderful? I hope we all, those of us who are saved here, those of us whose sins have been forgiven through Jesus Christ, his death on the cross, how can we cease to long for other people to be saved? There's something wrong if we don't long for other people to hear this message. And that was really the story of her life. And she says in her book, just in closing, right at the end, she says, you too are selected to live. This was the title of her book. Be persuaded when you hear his voice, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And what she's saying is that, okay, her experience was quite unique, and all these miraculous escapes, and she felt God's hand was upon her, and God had a plan for her life, and so he had. What she's saying is God's a plan for your life too. God's a plan for your life too. God has brought you here. Do you think you're in this room today by accident? I don't think so for a minute. Uh, you're here because God wants you to be here. God's got a plan for your life and God's got a message for you. And if you've never come to the Lord Jesus, like Hansi, you can find out that this wonderful teacher, miracle worker, kind, loving man is actually God who died on the cross for your sins and rose from the dead. And if you trust him as your savior, then you'll know the savior that Hansi Douglas knew. And uh, so she's quite, quite recent, isn't it? 2002, not long ago. And as I say, some may remember, some may want to add to what I said. Um, but let's just bow now and give thanks. Give thanks for this woman's life and give thanks for a saviour who makes himself known to Jews and non-Jews alike. Let's just bow in prayer. Father, we thank thee for this story, so dramatic in many ways. And yet we give thanks that 
in it all, uh, this young girl came to know the Lord Jesus and came to know the true Messiah, came to know the Savior, uh, and now she's in heaven. Uh, all the suffering is past, all the grief is over. We give thanks that she's there because Christ died for the ungodly. And here we are today listening to this message, and uh, thou dost know what's going through our minds at the moment, but if anyone here has never trusted Christ, may this be the day of their decision. They're coming to Christ, they're believing in him, accepting what thy word says and trusting him as the only savior. And we pray that somebody may find the Lord Jesus uh, as their Messiah, as their savior, uh, even today. In the Lord's name, amen.